I think the first year of the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise was truly a special moment in time, especially looking back on it now. At the time of recording this, the first FNAF game was released over 9 years ago, while the movie was released to theaters only a few months ago. I was basically able to witness the slow progression of the indie game that made me afraid to leave my bedroom at night as a kid turn into a multi-million dollar franchise. In 2014, I would have been around 12 years old, so you know I was eating up FNAF content every day after school. I, of course, wasn't actually playing the game like most children at the time because I was broke and embarrassingly afraid of the series. Instead, I watched grown men play the keep up with the lore. Tangent aside, I followed the franchise very closely during its heyday, so I look back on those days fondly. But I would say the most poignant point in the franchise was on March 2nd, 2014, the day that Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was released, the final chapter of the FNAF series. Until it wasn't. Twice, arguably. And that's for one reason, one reason only. But whenever 3 came out, um, I, I, was, I really was starting to pay attention to criticism. You know, for instance, you know, even though I, I may have, you know, in some, you know, alternate life may have left the series alone at 3, people were not happy with the jump scare. And it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of as simple as that. People weren't happy with the jump scare of Springtrap. And that, and that really bothered me. Um, and so then that kind of, in my mind, that wouldn't let the series rest in a way. Let's talk about this. I'm going to assume that if you're watching this video, you're at least a little familiar with Five Nights at Freddy's 3. But just in case, I'll give a brief rundown of the game to inform the unfamiliar and refresh some of the old heads like me. FNAF 3 has you take control of the security guard at the brand new Fazbear Frights, a horror attraction inspired by the rumors of the Freddy Fazbear's franchise and has opened 30 years after the company's closure. The first night is actually quite notable, as it is one of the only games in the series where you cannot die because you are alone in the empty attraction. Except for the call coming from who the fanbase has dubbed the phone dude, this tutorial night basically consists of nothing interesting. It's not until the next night that we are introduced to the subject of today's video. Golden Bonnie. <laughs> Salvage. <laughs> Springtrap. From this point on, each night consists of you trying to locate Springtrap's position so you can use your audio lure or vent closing system to prevent him from entering your doorless office. This wouldn't be too difficult on its own if it weren't for the phantom animatronics that negatively affect your only means of defense through technical errors. The real challenge comes from having to juggle distracting Springtrap and fixing any errors on your maintenance panel until 6am rolls around. And when you do hear the victory chimes, you are rewarded with Springtrap's origin story through playable 8-bit minigames, consisting of the original animatronics being brought into a back room of the pizzeria to be destroyed by the murderous Purple Man we now know as William Afton. At the end of the final cutscene, we witness William, in an act of desperation when confronted by the spirits of his past victims, hastily climb into the Springlock Bonnie suit, where he dies in a Springlock failure incident and is left the rot. As for my thoughts on the game, I have plenty of mixed feelings. When it comes to gameplay, FNAF 3 is one of my least favorites to return to when I have a classic FNAF itch that needs scratching. I just think the gameplay loop in this one is a little too repetitive, which to be fair, most older FNAF games are pretty repetitive, but this one's probably the worst in that regard. Personally, I think most of the fun that comes from FNAF games is having to balance a handful of different tasks to ward off all the animatronics in a stressful yet satisfying way. For example, in FNAF 1 you might end up having Bonnie or Chica right outside the office door draining your battery while Foxy is one phase away from charging down the hall. Meanwhile, Freddy is slowly approaching unless you check in on him from the cameras. Depending on the order you choose to ward off each animatronic and how quickly you do so could mean life or death. And in my opinion, that's where a lot of the fun comes from in the core gameplay loop. It makes you want to learn how each animatronic in the game as a whole works. Or how about FNAF 2? I feel like I don't even have to explain how tense a night in that game can get when you have 10 animatronics constantly appearing in the office while the puppet's music box needs winding. This sort of thing doesn't really exist in FNAF 3. The only real threat is Springtrap, and the phantoms are too easy to avoid. Let's just go down the list real quick. Phantom Freddy appears in the window in front of your office and walks across to get your attention. All you need to do is look at one of the monitors instead of him, which is what you're usually doing anyways, and you're fine. Phantom Foxy will randomly appear in the office to your left and just requires you to flip the camera monitor up for him to disappear. Meanwhile, Phantom Balloon Boy will randomly appear on any of the cameras and requires you to flip the monitor down or switch cams for him to disappear. Phantom Chica only appears in the arcade cabinet on Cam 7, so you can literally just never use that camera, or if you do, just click off of it right away. 
I've played FNAF 3 several times over the years and I've literally never seen Phantom Chica. Similarly, Phantom Mangle and Phantom Puppet will appear on cams 4 and 8 and can be avoided by avoiding those cameras too. If you play your cards right, you can essentially keep Springtrap stuck in one room with minimal Phantom opportunities, minimizing risk and fun by proxy. Now with that rant over, you would think I don't find anything in this game redeemable. But what gets me to come back to Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is the presentation. I genuinely believe FNAF 3 has the best atmosphere out of any of the games in the series. The environment in this game is perfectly decrepit. The layout of the horror attraction and its decor really makes you feel as if you are what is essentially Fazbear Entertainment's tomb. Usually I don't like monochromatic palettes, but the green in this game really gives it its own identity among the rest of the games in the franchise. And the ambience, man, the ambience is iconic. I realize the soundtrack isn't what people come to this franchise for, but the title screen for the original PC version of this game is a perfect tone setter. The same goes for the song during actual gameplay. And then there's the addition of the track that plays when a threat is close. Also, can I just say this is a huge improvement from the Danger Ambience from FNAF 2? This one is just too repetitive and frankly too loud in comparison to the rest of the audio in the game. You can probably barely hear me over it right now, it's getting goddamn loud and annoying and announced. But one of my favorite musical moments in this game, no, the whole series, are the ending themes. If you fail to release the spirits in the end, you get this song. It's a slow and somber broken sounding track with hints of childhood innocence through the use of a music box, befitting the bad ending where the victims of Afton are still not laid to rest. Meanwhile, the good ending has a beautiful sense of finality, both for the story of the lost children and the series as a whole. Or so we thought, as you know FNAF 3 was not the final game in the series, but it could have been so easily. Most of the big questions were answered, and the spirits of the missing children were freed from their metallic prisons. But there was one thing that apparently needed fixing. Now Springtrap actually has two jump scare animations, but they're honestly not that much different from each other. If Springtrap enters the office from the door to your left, he steps forward as his eyes widen. If he were to enter from the right, he actually lurches a bit forward while slightly opening his mouth. Now I kinda understand why these jump scares are so divisive despite not agreeing to the sentiment myself. It's not like any of the previous jump scares at all. While the animatronics used to flail, bite, and pounce at the player in previous games, Springtrap just sort of confronts the player. In comparison to the older ones, Springtraps are a lot less startling and arguably boring. But what we can say about Springtrap's jump scares is that they're unique, and I would argue purposely so. One detail people miss when talking about Springtrap's FNAF 3 jump scares is that they are not only different from jump scares in previous games, but other jump scares in FNAF 3 as well. 
While the few phantoms that directly jump scare the player also mostly just approach the player, their movements are noticeably more aggressive and wild than Springtrap's, and I think this was done to show a contrast between him and other animatronics within the context of the game and his character. Firstly, Springtrap is a very unique entity within the FNAF series lore-wise. Springtrap is the only animatronic we know for certain is possessed by the spirit of an adult instead of a child, and not just any adult, the one behind all the tragedies within the franchise. It can be assumed that these factors give him a special amount of awareness not present in most other animatronics, and I believe this is demonstrated best with his animations and poses found throughout FNAF 3. When looking at the cameras, Springtrap seems to actively try to stay just out of view of the player's line of sight. Contrast this to the behavior of previous animatronics who almost seem like they want to be seen by the night guard in most cases, it's clear that Springtrap is actively using the poor quality of her cameras and the darkness of the attraction to hide from the player. This extends to his behavior off camera as well. When near the office door, Springtrap will lean around the corner to stare at the player until he is spotted. However, there are a few behaviors of his that seem to stand in opposition to the previous examples. The biggest example of this is when Springtrap appears in the office window and just stares, only moving once a monitor is pulled up or a phantom attacks. But I would argue that this simply demonstrates his awareness even more. He's able to change his tactics depending on the situation. He knows to play it safe and stealthy when far away from the night guard to close the distance between them, but also knows how to be threatening and imposing when near his prey to make the night guard more likely to panic and slip up. Taking this unique self-awareness into account, we can assume that Springtrap is not acting on instinct in search of revenge like his victims in previous entries. Based on what we know about Afton's character, it is more than likely he is consciously planning each move he is making as he tries his best to fight the suit's programming. He is reveling in his rebirth as Springtrap, reveling in the fact that he can continue his reign of terror indefinitely, reveling in the fact that he has been served a new victim on a silver platter in the form of a security guard. When Springtrap slowly approaches you in his jump scares while grinning, he is enjoying the fact he's given the opportunity to kill again. He doesn't need the charger bite you because that would spoil the fun. He's really in it for the terror on your face, and when the game cuts out to the game over screen, we can only imagine what's in store for the Fazbear Frights Night Guard. Like most of the appeal of the horror in the older FNAF games, sometimes it's what we're not shown that really builds a sense of terror. And that's just going off of lore and speculation that was around at the time of the game's release. If we were to argue that the Night Guard is Michael Afton, then it makes even more sense for Willem to not directly attack his son. At this point in the timeline, it's more than likely their last conversation was what led Mike to the sister location, so William would be shocked and intrigued to see his son after everything that's happened to both of them. In brief, I think Springtrap's first jump scares are completely in character when considering what we know about William Afton as a character and his story, both at the time of FNAF 3's release and now after almost a decade of new lore. Now I sure do hope that fan reception of the animations in this game doesn't lead to a continuous downward spiral of mischaracterization in future jump scares. Damn, Daniel. Yeah, I'll keep this brief because calling the pizzeria jump scares and ultimate custom night jump scares lackluster is beating a dead horse. I will at least give Scrap Trap Salvage jump scare some kudos because I think it looks a little reminiscent of the FNAF 3 jump scares on top of the scene's lighting actually making this whack ass design look pretty cool and menacing. His office jump scare on the other hand looks weird because it's basically just a sped up version of the salvage one and it just looks unnatural. I mean, if he's coming out of the vent, how could he possibly be positioned like this? And then there's the UCN Springtrap jump scare. It just looks wrong to me. Like, I feel like Springtrap's costume mouth should only open rarely, and like once each time it does, to give his skeletal remains more oomph. All this lip movement seems unnecessary, and what's with the weird shoulder movements too? There's simply too much going on, and it doesn't go with the characterization we saw in FNAF 3. And the Scrap Trap one is even stranger. He's basically just thrusting back and forth in an awkward manner that doesn't elicit fear at all. I believe these jump scares further emphasize the importance of a reserved Springtrap jump scare. All the flailing and mouth movement doesn't fit him in my opinion. I can't confirm this of course, but I feel like it seems as if Scott Coffin was really trying to make it up to the fans who didn't like the original jump scare, even if the new ones are a bit jarring. Which is admirable at the end of the day of course, and it seems like the same mindset he kept for the rest of the series. Speaking of which, let's go over that interview clip from earlier again so I can be more specific about my feelings on the continuation of FNAF series after the third game. It's clear that the Springtrap jumpscare isn't the only reason FNAF 4 was created. It's honestly not even the real reason Scott seems to give in this clip. It wasn't because of the jumpscare, it was because of the fans. I think regardless of what you think of the franchise or Scott Cawthon as an individual, I think it's very clear that what he has always put first in the FNAF series was a fan base, and it's pretty commendable. So yes, I do like the FNAF 3 jumpscare, but no, I don't think the response to it ruined the franchise or anything. I hope you enjoyed this video that started out as a short analysis of a single animation and ended up as a review of FNAF 3, and my thoughts on the series.
I have a lot to say in this series, so if you enjoyed this little discussion, let me know and I'd love to make more videos like this. Who knows, maybe a non-chronological retrospective of the series would be perfect for its upcoming 10th anniversary. Let me know what you think in the comments, leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and consider subscribing for more videos like this one. In the meantime, how about watching some of my older videos? Until next time, make sure to never check cams 4 or 7 or my phantom will appear in your house.